Okay, we're on and popping. We're on and popping. Hello, we're on and popping. Let's get jiggy with it, as they say. So today we're going to be talking about self-discipline. Particularly self-discipline as it applies to um, people pleasers and people who have acquired um, learned helplessness. If you thought I was going to give you a few little hacks that would magically uh, cause you to suddenly become self-disciplined, oh dear, oh dear, oh dearie me, no, that isn't going to happen. Being self-disciplined um, isn't something that you can think your way into doing. Being self-disciplined means that you have to take actions and those actions have to take place at the external level out there in the world and typically being self-disciplined means that you have to take actions in doing things that you don't really want to do or that you could put off or that you could do a different way it's choosing self-discipline over self-indulgence it's taking the less easy route when people with cptsd who are in their CPTSR, their complex, 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 <laughs> complex post-traumatic stress response, which means that over a lifetime of living as a human entity in socks on this planet, they've picked up some bumps, some scuffs along the way, and they're carrying a little bit of pain. Over time, that pain accumulates and becomes depression, anxiety, anger management issues, addiction, dissociation, the most common mental health issues. So when we're talking about people who might be dealing with a CPTSR response, when we're leaning in like good yogis into self-discipline, the way in which we do it is very important. Quick recap for the dissociators out there. Self-discipline is the opposite of self-indulgence. Self-discipline is not something that you can think your way in and out of. It's about taking action. It's about taking action in the external world and it's about taking action to do the things that you wouldn't normally choose to do. And then the next point I made was the way you do this is going to be critical. I'd like you to watch this video. I'd like to achieve my goal, which is to have people watch this video and find themselves naturally and unconsciously becoming more self-disciplined with very little effort and struggle. I'd like this to be effortless for you. And it will be because I'm dead good at what I do. But I'm going to have to recap for you a few times, okay? So you're going to be taking action that is not the easiest path, that is not the path of self-indulgence, but a path of self-discipline. And you're going to be doing it. You're not going to be thinking about it. You're going to actually do things. When you make a list of things to do and your alarm goes off at half six in the morning or earlier or later, depending, and you with a smile on your face and a, a, a determination in your step, leap out of bed and then go and do those things, you have committed an act of self-discipline. And every time you do that, you'll get better and better and better at doing it you'll face less and less internal resistance but it's an ethic change that needs to happen ethic it's your ethic it's what you do and who you must become it's who you must become now for people with cptsr we're dealing with emotional flashbacks which is one element of our challenge which is tough but not the toughest thing the the tougher thing is the superego and codependency. If you think that you have a lifetime of micro traumas that have built up to the point where you're suffering with anxiety, depression, addictive, or self-destructive patterns of behavior, you may well have CPTSR. If you do have a little bit of this, and I personally believe 100% of the population of humanity does, that's my opinion, um, then you will have an issue with what the Freudian psychoanalyst called a superego. We're going to call it the internal judge. The internal judge. That part of yourself that is critical, judgmental, and that condemns you. 
It's a value system and it's the application of the value system. It's called the super ego. I don't want to get my Latin and my Greek mixed up. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's Latin. Um, no, I'm not sure about that. But it means above. So when we think of Superman or superpowers, we think um, of, of grandiosity. But it literally means above. If you say supra, it means above and encompassing. It's like an umbrella term, supra. But super just means above. This is superior to that. It's just above it. It's just above it. So the ego is the superego, the internal judges on high, condemning, watching your actions and going wrong, no, don't, no, no, not that, not like that, and, and being critical if it's toxic. When you have dealt with the emotional flashbacks, it will be less toxic. So when we're trying to be self-disciplined, you will fight with this internal voice. When you try to be self-disciplined, the internal voice will attempt to stop you. Why? Because the internal voice is the tribe, is culture, is family. It may actually be um, ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, ex-partners. Anybody in your life who's told you no or said you can't do it or you're weak or who has shamed you, you'll have internalized these messages and the internal judge plays them continuously. A non-toxic internal judge or internal critic doesn't do that. A well-functioning superego simply applies your value system to your life like a good parent would. Don't do that even though you want to do that. Don't do it because in the long term, it's not going to be good for you. What you should do is this instead. That's what a good parent would do. That's what you've internalized. These internalized voices, commands, come through if you want the technical language, they come through as super ego injunctions. These are kind of like commands from the judge that tells you to do something. The voices you've internalized, more technical terminology for those who are interested, are called introjects. So as soon as you pick up your sword, your spear and your shield, brave young Spartans, and you say, today is the day I'm going to become self-disciplined, there is a chance that the internal judge will wake up and say, oh, no, you're fucking well not. If you engage in a battle with the internal judge, it's highly likely that all you're going to do is create a lot of internal struggle, exhaust yourself, go into an emotional flashback, and then follow the path of self-indulgence rather than the path of self-discipline. Self-indulgence being, okay, I'll just, I don't know, watch Netflix dissociate, zone out, and eat salty deliciousness until my belly is full, and then I can't think because I'm so full I can't move. We've all done it. <laughs> We've all done it. Every human being who can do that has done that. I don't know if you guys know about the uh, the experiment that was done with the monkeys where they gave them, uh, it was really cruel, they, they attached uh, electrodes, the pleasure sensor in the brain, and they wanted to work out how long it would take for the monkey to figure out that if they push a button, they would experience uh, pleasure. And um, the monkeys found out quite quickly. And given the chance, if they were not stopped, they would just pleasure themselves nonstop all day. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't communicate. They would forego every other thing. They just matrix pod blue pill give me the cipher treatment all day until they became sick. So they had to stop them. They were already sick because they had their scalps opened and electrodes pumped into their brains. So that wasn't very good for them. So you've got to be careful of that internal instinct, which is going to be towards self-indulgence. It's going to be towards eating the salty thing and the sweet thing. Why? Because we're creatures that are born of hardship, that have evolved through scarcity. And so it's difficult for us to leap out of bed and start running when there's no predator there that's a stupid thing to do to leap out of bed and go and do oh i'm gonna go and do 50 burpees now why nobody's telling you to do it it goes against evolutionary patterns i'm telling you this not so that you give up and don't leap out of bed i'm telling you this so that you can be kind to yourself and realize aha i'm not lazy i'm evolutionarily evolved 
to be self in quote unquote self indulgent because we evolved through famine, disease, uh, plagues, you know, uh, war, genocides. And so if you had the chance to eat, you would gorge. And all of our ancestors who survived all the murder, all the rape, all the genocide, all the starvation, they built who we are. So you're like, oh, I hate myself for being so anxious. Come, f fuck my anxiety. Well, your ancestors were the, wrong, were the ones who ran fastest. All the brave ancestors who are like, I'll walk around in the jungle at night. I don't give a fuck. I got my stick. They died. All the anxious ones are like, I'm not going to the jungle at night. They lived. Yes, it's neurotic. Yes, it holds us back. But it's good to have perspective, a sense of humor, and an attitude of forgiveness for our own frailty as the creatures we are. Forgive yourself for what you are. Forgive yourself for the entity that you've evolved into being. It happened before you were awakened conscious. It's not your fault, but this is where we are. If we follow this evolutionary wave, this momentum that is there in the direction that it's already going, it generally speaking doesn't lead to good places. Right now in uh, the UK, apparently we like America. We follow in America's footsteps every time. We now have an opioid usage crisis. We now have a huge gambling crisis, uh, online gambling. Many people are very, very addicted to online, online gambling and they're very addicted to op opioids. In my humble opinion, the drivers for both of those actions, while seemingly at an external level to be very different, are probably in their root principle from a behavioral psychology perspective, very similar. It's a desire to escape. It's just a desire to escape. That's all it is. And the internal feelings that those two different people get, whether it's opioids or, in, or, or online gambling, will not be dissimilar. The root trauma that leads them there will not be dissimilar. This is very normal for me to think this way because I do this every day for a living. But other people, when I'm talking to about it, I'm like, can't you see how, you know, sometimes alcoholism is just a desire to dampen a sense of anxiety. And they'll be like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And I'm like, why do you really think of it that way? But it's not normal to think of it that way. That's not the regular way of thinking. I wish that it were, though. I wish that it were. I think if we came to understand the beings that we are with compassion, not sentimentality, I'm not a fan of sentimentality. I think it's extremely dangerous. But with authentic compassion and a desire to do well and to be the best that we can be, we're the very human, very organic, very gentle, very kind way, we can get a lot done. So in your application of self-discipline, to recap, the recap of the recap. Self-discipline is the opposite of self-indulgence. You're going to do the harder thing and you're going to do it. It's not an internal process. Self-discipline is you getting up earlier in the morning with a written list of things to do. It's the gym, it's your new business venture, it's whatever it is that you've been putting off and you just do it happily, cheerfully, because that's the Spartan Life Coach way. I don't want you gritting your teeth and growling through it. I want you to put on the, 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 the good music that you enjoy. I want you to dance your way through it out of nothing more than a perverse defiance for that internal judge, which is nothing more than a rebellion against every evildoer that you've ever encountered in your life that's put ba bad messages inside of your head. So to do it is a victory. To do it and smile and dance is... You're a conqueror when you're doing that. You're a conqueror. Self-discipline is action. It's not a question of thought. Self-discipline comes down to your ethic. It's your ethic, which means your it's your way of life. The way in which you do self-discipline is critical. Do it kindly. Do it organically. See it as a long-term thing. If you go, oh, I'm going to just buckle down and do this. I'm going to hammer it tomorrow. All the research is in on that, and it runs out. The, there is, uh, the human will is a very, very powerful thing, but it's limited. 
it's it's limited it, you know if you're trying to get something done through sheer willpower eventually you run out it's a it's a finite resource the people who are doing amazing things in their lives and i know some of them i work with i'm very lucky i'm very privileged in that i regularly work with top level world class athletes um they don't grit their way through training sessions they just don't think about training the way the rest of us do they don't think about nutrition the way the rest of us do when you're talking to high level business people who've done really really well you'll find that their view of something as simple as money which we think we all have a great and agreed perspective on they don't see it the way the rest of us see it their perspective is different so for self discipline to stick this would mean the way in which we do it needs to be kind and organic and it needs to be open to change we have to be willing to change the way we see things i've spoken to you recently about strengths and skills self discipline is a strength the more you do it the more you grow the self discipline muscle and it will definitely develop over time but i would rather of the two that you saw it more as a skill so you be cunning in how you negotiate with yourself to do the things that you would like to get done be cunning so you sometimes are going to have to sell it to yourself so we've already talked a little bit of the freudian psychoanalytic model of the super ego which we'll call the internal judge we can also talk about the id which is the inner child so sometimes the inner child which controls your energy which controls your motivation which controls your enthusiasm which controls your libidinous lust for life will kick off so if you say this is what we're doing tomorrow and the inner child throws a shit fit and a temper tantrum you're going to have to negotiate with the inner child skillfully to get that little entity to align with what it is that you want to do and that is more about skill you can't bully the child into doing it you can try but again like willpower it won't last the um internal judge may try and bully the inner child to do it through shaming guilt tripping basically anything that you experienced in childhood from your teachers from family from parents siblings to motivate you to do the worst elements of it that's what the inner judge is going to do to your internal child to try and get you to do the thing that you don't really want to do and it's not going to end well that is not building your house on a uh, firm ground that's definitely building a house on sand so this kind of uh, self discipline i'm talking about that's going to last for you it's really going to change the way you live your life and the way you get things done is about you altering your internal ethic skillfully and intelligently with both kindness and determination you need to be very clear of vision and you must have a sense of humor because as you're moving forward what's going to happen is parts of you inside are going to try and do this thing that we call self sabotage and you will need a sense of humor to skillfully and cunningly negotiate your way around these self sabotaging efforts you're going to get much more traction you're going to get much more longevity in the changes if it comes from humor if it comes from love if it comes from skill and you think in terms of building in the long term then if you violently and aggressively to yourself with violence and aggression to the self try and bully yourself into doing it so you must be willing to change you must be willing to change the way that you think about discipline and the way that you think about getting things done discipline is an unfortunate word because when we discipline somebody it's a punishment um but to be a disciple and to have the discipline is actually a gateway to freedom but it's consistent action that's taken over time it's consistent daily action over time and you can't grunt your way and scream your way and psych your your way through it like you're going to do a really heavy set of deadlifts and you start beating your chest and going <laughs> that only lasts that adrenaline surge can it, it, it like the physical entities that we are that adrenaline surge it can only last uh, in a length of time that is measured in minutes not days and you need it for days you need it for months you need it for years just because you couldn't get yourself to do something up until now doesn't mean that you can't easily with no battle with no stress with no emotional flashbacks smoothly kindly gently get yourself to do it from now on 
I don't recommend you start making major changes in your life too rapidly. Build the neural pathway slowly. If you do have CPTSR, that means that, or you're working with other mental health issues, that means you can show yourself slowly and organically over time. It is safe and good and right for me to be this thing called self-disciplined sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes you're gonna be self-indulgent. Sometimes you're gonna be self-disciplined. Sometimes you're gonna be right on the edge between the two. And you're gonna look at the thing that you could do, the self-indulgent thing you could do. And you're gonna say, you know what? Skillfully and with a sense of humor and a sense of being intelligent about living my life, I'm actually gonna say no to this thing one time. It's not about big dramatic gestures, nothing in life is. Name the endeavor, name the thing you wanna get done. It's a series of tiny actions made again and again and again. This is all the difference uh, in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Okay, I went for 21 minutes and I will now take questions. Please make them one sentence long, make them relevant to the subject. And if you could have them end in a question mark, I'd be so frog on delighted. Zara Phoenix says, it's hard because I have this fight or flight response. Zara, that's called an emotional flashback. And if you, um, if you look up Pete Walker, uh, fight flight response you'll get it uh, you get it on google you get it free you get a good explanation of what's happening there you need to reduce the emotional flashbacks in fact there is a link uh, i think i pinned the comment to the top too many people are having problems getting that uh stop emotional flashback course now i think email uh, email gmail yahoo and hotmail are all really strict now so i've just pinned it to the bottom of this video so you can just get that course now it's free Shannon L says, I don't understand what you mean by being sentimental. I said, um, don't be sentimental. Don't be sentimental. Look up a definition of sentimentality and um, realize the dangerous boundary eroding indulgence that sentimentality is and try to steer away from it. It is not compassion. It's not empathy. And it's really not healthy. Sentimentality is a, an infantile way of, um, an infantile boundaryless way of accessing and expressing emotions that tends to supersede a rational thought. And it's just not appropriate uh, or effective for adults to do that. How do I up level my emotional intelligence as master discipline, master life? Well, I'm glad you asked. Master Discipline, Master Life, because as it happens, I have a course that teaches you how to do that. So if you want the free version of the course, it's called Emotional Literacy, and it's available on my Instagram. My Instagram is bewilderingly called Richard Grannon, which is the name I was given at my birth. There is an Emotional Literacy course available on my website, but I would say to most people, you just do the free what the free version first for 30 days. Get get used to it. If you like it, then get the paid for course. That will up your emotional intelligence. Kim says, what determines the amount of willpower we have as humans? Um, it is something you can grow. It's something you can develop like a muscle. Um, so have you had to face a lot of adversity? Have you had to do a lot of things that you really didn't want to do? over the course of your life again and again and again across multiple contexts then you'll probably have a little bit more willpower nick bravo asks richard grant is sentimentality grieving over what could have been no 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 my dear it is not um sentimentality i guess is kind of an it's an old-fashioned word um there's a little bit of confusion okay so the first one i've got from the oxford dictionary is um excessive excessive tenderness sadness or nostalgia uh and then from merriam webster we have the definition the quality or state of being sentimental especially to excess or in affectation so it's about excess boundarylessness 
affectation says merriam webster so that would mean it's actually posturing um it's, it's actually quite insincere which is interesting um, but there is there is that element to it so sentimentality are any of you Marillion fans you remember the album script for a jester's tear uh i can't remember the name of the, the track the lyric is um so here i am once more in the playground of the broken heart da -da -da -da. overdosed yet another emotional suicide so the guy's lamenting another broken relationship um, that he felt bound into um oh yet another emotional suicide that's his fault that the relationship broke down overdosed on sentiment and pride there's we can distort our own our own reality if there's drugs and alcohol involved obviously it's going to be even worse but if we're already traumatized and emotionally dysregulated there is a, a leaning towards not seeing clearly so the emotions of somebody who's regulated will go up and down more or less appropriately to the external stimulus when people are very emotionally dysregulated the up and down of the emotions is huge and it, it warps your perception you don't see things as they are you you do you do projection and you will do projective identification um sentimentality the one of the reasons why we have to be very careful of sentimentality is it, it's a marker for psychopathy so you'd think but how can it be like if you care about something and you love something, how could that be a marker for something as cold and non-empathic as psychopathy? And it's like, well, it's not that there's no emotion in the cluster B spectrum, the narcissist and the psychopath. It's that it comes out in this very warped, um, infantile way in this boundaryless quite self-indulgent way sentimentality is a self-indulgent thing so it's more about me enjoying the moment of you know just fucking up all of this emotion but grieving over what could have been is um is a completely valid thing to do grieving is is very necessary very very necessary prozac works well to deal with what a cynical comment. I've never taken it, but yes. CT says, it's refreshing to see you serious and also silly. I'm always serious and also silly, aren't I? Um, how, Lucy asks, how could I tell if I'm in an emotionally abusive relationship or I'm just having emotional uh, flashbacks? I have PTSD, borderline personality disorder and anxiety. Uh, if you... I've been diagnosed uh, with PTSD and borderline personality disorder, and you're struggling with anxiety as well. It's going to be very hard for you to distinguish whether a, a relationship is emotionally abusive or not, because by definition, you're um, you're emotionally dysregulated. The HPA axis will be dysregulated, so your perception of the meaning of communications is going to be warped, and um, you know, somebody could offer you a cup of tea and you could experience that internally as a gesture of contempt or a threat or an insult if you're very heavily emotionally dysregulated. It's one of the um, valid uh, criticisms that was leveled at me recently saying that, you know, basically if, well, as far as red flags are concerned in toxic relationships, I was saying to people, well, how does it make you feel? If you feel that there's something wrong there, then there's probably something wrong there. Well, actually, sometimes people think that there's something wrong there and there isn't. My stance on it was leaning more towards saying, look, if you feel like there's something wrong there, you should do both the humans in the relationship a favor and leave. But what I wasn't saying was, because that to me sounds like you're just not ready to be in a relationship. If you're flashbacking so strong that you can't tell whether somebody's abusive or not you probably should do them a favor and break up with them or explain to them what's going on and um see if you can get help for both of you but that's uh that would need to be negotiated with your partner and with with your therapist and i personally i have to be very bluntly honest with you having seen um, 
what this can do to people and i've been doing this like for years now uh the amount of warping that the emotional flashbacks can do is very extreme very very extreme um and uh if you're flashbacking very hard it's, it's going to be difficult so i mean flip side of the coin emotional flashbacks can be gotten a hold of you can work to stop the emotional flashbacks there's there's exercises the disciplines you can follow that will emotionally re-regulate you um i don't want to sound mean but like you know there are things that you're not supposed to ask in or say in mental health but i'm not a mental health practitioner i'm a life coach who talks about the subject and i would also say this if you're into drugs my friend if you're into drugs you've got nobody but yourself to blame if you're an, if you're in a drug taking alcohol drinking lifestyle and then you turn around because i had this conversation with a mate of mine just last night um if you're drinking a lot just drinking forget about other drugs and you're emotionally dysregulated and you've got ptsd or cptsd help yourself get off the alcohol it's not just because it's legal doesn't mean it's okay if you're emotionally vulnerable alcohol is probably one of the worst drug uh, drugs that you could take if you're emotionally dysregulated you've got to stop drinking you've got to go dry for a couple of, i was gonna say a couple of months maybe that's too harsh but if it was me i'd want a couple of months because if you're you're talking about the rest of your life for the person so i want to make that decision sober clean healthy i wanted to do like eight weeks of you know some self-disciplined personal development work getting up in the morning doing some affirmations getting some meditation and getting the yoga in getting some walks in no drugs no alcohol just clean living for eight weeks get some sleep i'm not good with no sleep and, and alcohol fucks up your sleep so we all have it slightly differently you've got to know yourself and you've got to know where you're coming from um and yeah you you got to be you got to be sober you got to be straight edge and then you take a breath and you look you look at the person you go okay this is this is good or this is bad some people's relationships depend on alcohol and drugs and i can give you a very straight answer to that one <laughs> that's not a good relationship it's not a good relationship I'm not judging you i've been in them myself how I spent most of my twenties was drugs, alcohol, and uh, general general naughty behaviour. Um, but I had zero chance of seeing any partner I was with. Zero chance, as they were. I could only see them through a series of projections. Bonnie asks Richard, "How do you start healing the inner child?" Um, I, I, it's not my bag. I'm not really a, a, an inner child um, guy. Um, it's uh, you heal the whole system uh, to me, and what you'll hear me say a lot. I don't think I've seen your handle before. I'm usually pretty good with names. Um, if you're new here, what you'll hear me going back to a hell of a lot: reduce the emotional flashbacks increase your emotional literacy reduce the emotional flashbacks increase the emotional literacy develop a new narrative and i don't really go outside of that because these are the only things i've seen that have, that have, that have worked um so i'm not the guy who's like oh this is how we heal the inner child i'm the guy who says this is how we reduce emotional flashbacks develop our emotional literacy and then reclaim personal sovereignty justino can you talk more about introjection I don't have many disciplined people in my life to look to for inspiration. Yeah, man, um, that's tricky. What a great time to be alive, though, in your situation, because podcasts and uh, YouTube interviews and the technology that we have, you can, in your spare time, you can be filling your head with the, with the words of the world's greatest philosophers. You could be getting into your Terence McKenna, Alan Watts, Zizek, you know, whoever appeals to you based on your lifestyle, your culture, your religion, your background, your goals, whatever it is, and you could be listening to them all the time. And I, that's not a bad discipline to maintain. Um, and then those, that, that's not really introjects, but they're kind of like a, a simulation of a technology technological interject and it helps i listen to uh 
to podcasts. I listen to podcasts all the time. I, I, I it's with intent. I'm like, I want to hear something that's either going to teach me something, or is going to help me grow, or help me to mature, um, or is going to make me laugh. So there's that self indulgent stuff as well. So today I was like, there's the the great thing about the tech. I had to do a workout that I didn't want to do. I hate doing long slow cardio. I effing hate it. It's boring. So I listened to uh, Richard Pryor, old Richard Pryor stand up routines on YouTube, and it flew by like that on these headphones that I have, that we all have, that, that you don't even need a wire, they just talk to your phone. It's, it's great, it's incredible, so, so good. Such a, in so many ways, it's a, we're in a very lucky time to be alive, but yeah, uh, find them. There's, YouTube is, a, is such a great resource to find people who are disciplined in the way that you want for training, for money, for business, for health, for relationships, whatever you want, it's, it's all there for you. Thank you for your question, mate. Please speak up, guys. There's, a, um, there's, there's men watching, but they're not asking anything. Edward, who is a man, he's called Edward Mann, has a question. What are the lottery numbers? See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sorry, Edward, I don't know. Uh, okay, human life experience says, you mentioned running out. I think I might be bullying or hammering myself to smash the day, crash and burn style. I need balance and consistent pattern. Can you elaborate on negotiating with the id? Yeah, man. I mean, the way um, you talk to yourself inside your head, there's a question that I sometimes ask, which is I, I have uh, two little nephews. You know, uh, one of them is he's coming up on three years old. And, you know, I would ask myself, is this the way you would talk to a child? Is this the way you would talk to your nephew? And I'm like, no. Well, why are you doing it to you? Why are you being so blunt and harsh and aggressive with yourself if you wouldn't do that to a child? Because I know it doesn't work. It, it, it might work a little bit for short term, but it doesn't work long term. And the cost further down the line is, is huge because it's generating toxic shame. So you would speak to yourself the way you would lovingly speak to a sensitive and vulnerable child. That's probably the best advice I could give you for that. Thanks for your question. Darth Shady, Lava Lan. I like your avatar. Your avatar kind of looks like Avatar. You sent me into a regression. I'm confused now. Your avatar looks like a character from Avatar. All right, snap out of it. Um, repost. How can a people pleaser can deal with controlling people? Oh, yeah, supposed to work. People pleasers today. Shit. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, how can a people please deal with controlling people? Um, so self-discipline and people pleasing and controlling people. The Everything I just said about self-discipline still applies. The same principles apply. So the way in which you do it is the most important thing. The self-indulgence of a people pleaser this is going to be a tough inversion for some people, and I might get some blowback in the comments for this. The self-indulgence of people pleasers and codependents is to obey a bullying, toxic personality. That's our self-indulgence. My recovery uh, in codependency got a lot stronger and faster when I realized that what I was doing was a self-indulgence, and I was acting like an addict. So people pleasers need to remember that people pleasing is the addiction codependents need to remember that being a codependent is our addiction the eradication of the self for a lot of reasons i won't get into it right now but like there's an addictive quality to it and there are advantages to putting somebody else's needs first all the time uh, and to, to put it in a short form it's a way of hiding it's a way of dodging your responsibility and and the responsibility of being you of being authentically you and vulnerable. That's the self-indulgence that you have to say no to. So you will think, oh, I have to say no to those people. How do I say no to those people outside of me? And actually, you've got to say no to you because your instinct will be to serve. How can I serve you? And I'm like, no, you don't. You have to say, no, I'm not going to serve them right now. I'm not going to do that. That would be my my advice. That's that's for people pleasers and codependents. Our self-discipline is saying no to the self-indulgence of people pleasing. They're saying no 
the self-indulgence of being a codependent and obeying bullying abusive types we have to be uh, show restraint in the face of our addiction our impulse uh, to serve to learn to put yourself first rachel munger says don't people please be more wolf absolutely viola viola says thank you richard thank you for being here viola viola um The false critic says, what if the shift to positive it has caused me to be less driven to achieve? Um, well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I would um, look at what was driving you to achieve before. Or maybe it was an inauthentic and neurotic drive. You might have been trying to fulfill your father's dreams or your mother's dreams, and they were not your own. So now you have a more positive relationship with your id your internal child it might be time to do a bit of house cleaning and uh, reset your course in life <clears throat> sandy cricket says how to practice self-discipline and balance when you're used to the front lines push through and get things done mode um, I'm not sure I understand that question. How do you practice self-discipline when you're used to the front lines, push through, get things done mode? You can you can have a, a mode that is pushed through and get things done. That's okay. I don't see a problem with that, unless it's a problem, in which case you need to resolve the problem. But there's no... There's no uh, if you're screaming at yourself internally, that's not great. Um, if you're talking to yourself internally like a drill instructor, that's not great. But if you're still acting in a self-disciplined way, then you would have achieved the target of being self-disciplined. So we go, were you self-disciplined? And you would say, yeah. And I go, well done. Were you self-disciplined in a way that hurt you? And then only you can answer that question. Yes, it's hurting me. Well, no, it's not hurting me. It's not hurting you. You keep doing it. That's a strategy that's working for you. You you might have a drill instructor running inside of your head that's screaming at you, and you might feel nothing about it. You might just be like, yeah, well, I'm all right with that. I don't mind a drill instructor screaming. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't feel guilted or anything. So it's really about where you're up to emotionally, if it's damaging you or not. And if it's not, then that's cool, man. Sandra on Facebook says, can you talk about trauma bonding, how to separate and reconcile those types of experiences? Um, well, I, I won't talk too much about it uh, because this is, this is, a, is mainly a, about uh, self-discipline, uh, particularly as it affects people pleasers, and we are going to talk about learned helplessness as well. Uh, trauma bonding, I have a course on it. Uh, it's available from spartanlifecoach.com. The essence of the course is around trying to reconcile the split we develop in our memories of the abusive person. That seems to be, well, for a start, I, I think that I popularized the term trauma bond in the narcissism community. And I think I, I did it with another uh, YouTube channel that's been banned since. It was a self-defense channel. And I was teaching women self-defense at the time. And um, the Rihanna Chris Brown case was on, I think this is back in 2009. And uh, I was watching a daytime TV show, uh, an American daytime TV show or American network news. And the woman who was in charge of America's largest organization for protecting women against domestic violence couldn't answer the question when it was posed to her by the, the, the anchor, the woman anchor, the news anchor said to her, why do women stay and she didn't have an answer and i was like shit that's okay she didn't have a good answer she had like these weird answers that people give so i went on a mission to find out and i got that term trauma bonding from cult psychology and i was like aha so what they do in cult psychology um which is not a field of, of study that's very big in the uk it's big in canada and it's big in america because you have a big problem with cults in canada and america um, it, and 
I, I now slightly regret it because strictly speaking, it's not trauma bonding. It At the time, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, okay, we'll call this trauma bonding. So if you're in a bad relationship, you can't get out. We'll, we'll, we'll use the cult terminology, trauma bonding. And it caught on and people started saying it. But it, it's actually not, uh, not, not quite. It's like you're right next door to trauma bonding. It's more to do with um, a, a different psychological effect. Trauma bonding is part of it. Is, is definitely part of it. But the thing that keeps people in the relationship and stopping them from leave from leaving is actually better described. Uh, it's a it's a Freudian psychoanalytic concept called the fetishist split. It's got nothing to do with sex fetishism. It's not. It's nothing to do with that. It's um, a fetish is something an object that we imbue with power as a child but it doesn't really have power we're just children and we we believe in magic so we go this this is the thing that makes the thing thing happen so we, we fetishize a thing an object or a person in the fetishist split we know that the relationship is bad we are totally aware that the relationship is awful and this person's a piece of shit but there's another part of them that responds to another part of us this is the split so you're uh, a woman he's bad and you see him as bad and that part of you is there absolute there's nothing wrong with you you're not schizophrenic you don't have a psychotic delusional disorder you perceive reality clearly and he's bad and you see he's bad but then there's a part of you that operates or comes into operation when he is being good so he splits you by splitting himself that's the fetishist split so he splits himself so sometimes he's awful and then sometimes he's super charming and there's a part of you that responds to that and so then you go uh, so you so he split his personality good and bad this is really he split multiple ways and you have to split multiple ways we'll keep it simple you split your memories of him and your perceptions of him as good and bad so you actually have two different hard drives, all the good memories, oh, sorry, all the bad memories go in this hard drive and all the good memories go in this hard drive. And never the twain meet because it's a split. You've fetishized, externalized, and you've split. <clears throat> so what happens is when you start crashing the two different neural pathways together, which is what the course teaches you to do, and the memories come together, you actually get a clearer perception of who the person is and you will not be as obsessed with them anymore. The obsession is never with the person. The obsession is with the mystery of the fetishist split because you're living in two separate realities. So your brain is going, why, why, how, why, why, how, how? And you you, you won't be able to sleep because it's cognitive dissonance. You You, you know and you do not know. And knowing that you know and do not know at the same time will drive you crazy. Cognitive dissonance, if you, I won't bother for everybody we explaining that. If you go and look it up, it's extremely uncomfortable for a human being to live inside of cognitive dissonance. You know and you do not know, and you feel stressed. That's the obsession. The person's incidental, but the brain, God bless it, the way we've evolved, the mammalian brain is protective and it says, what's happening? You go, I'm in pain. What are you in pain about? Uh, Bob, Bill, whatever the dude's name is, Bilbo. I'm in pain over Bilbo. Oh, that's the problem. Bilbo's the problem. Why are you thinking about Bilbo? Because I love him. I have this feeling here in my chest. There's probably anxiety. There's probably stress. And you go, well, Ja Rule told me that love is pain. So I guess this is love. <laughs> also, if you're raised in an abusive environment, another layer to the cake then you think that love is pain you think like all the love the experience was anxiety inducing and so you'll you'll have internalized love as being painful and anxiety inducing so it's not really the trauma it's not really a trauma bond it it is but that's only one part of the story it's actually uh we create a fetishist split about the person we it's not you, you don't do it consciously it's totally unconscious but that's how you get stuck that's how you get upset um and that's where reconciliation will come from is when you take these two hard drives 
with memories and experiences and perceptions and you put them into one hard drive, which is what, that's all the break trauma on course does, you'll then see the scales will be lifted from your eyes. There'll be a revelation, an apocalyptos. And you go, oh, this is what the guy is. Oh, he's, this is behind the curtain is what? The Wizard of Oz, just some silly man, you know, twiddling with levers and panicking and, you know, desperately trying to maintain an illusion. And uh, beyond that, there is um, not obsession and anxiety, but great sadness, great, great sadness. You will grieve because you will grieve in a way that you've never grieved before because it's not like losing a partner that you've loved and then you break up or they pass away or something happens and you can't be with them. You will face the task of grieving for a relationship that was a total illusion with a person who never was the guy that you love bilbo or frodo whoever it is is a figment of somebody's imagination he's the author he's the author that individual is the author and you're looking for that person but part of you knows they're not out there so you go crazy you do you, you go into this obsessive spiral it's uh, it's extremely uncomfortable i know i've lived it I used to moderate it with cocaine, alcohol, violence, and casual sex. But now I'm a life coach, and I don't do that. Cat <laughs> uh, Johnson says, any advice for talking back to your people-pleasing <clears throat> instinct in managing episodes of depersonalization? It's like a bully I can't stand up to that always reminds me the world's unsafe i don't think um reading in between the lines of your question i don't think there's going to be um like i can't just say to you say this say this to your people pleaser aspect um the people pleasing for you is about becoming invisible for you for some people it's like this it's it's a it's a deeper expression of a deeper trauma than perhaps you've even admitted to yourself it's like i don't have the permission to be i'm not just a wrong or bad object in my parents eyes i'm not allowed to be and so your emotional flashback remember the cptsd model your self-protection in the emotional flashback model is to disappear. How are we now, you've been doing it your whole life, probably. How are we now going to convince the unconscious that it's safe to be? So you, it's binary. It's a binary. You were a zero. And now we're asking you to be a one. You've never been a one. So it's like this whole, that's the route that you would need to pursue for this. That's the route I'd be going down. It's a, it's a, it's a bigger task. Than that it's a bigger task penny asks richard i'm codependent hello but how can you tell if it's codependency or it's your ego that's getting hurt or is it both um well codependency isn't separate to your ego and if there's pain there it wouldn't be the codependency that's that's experiencing the pain or the ego it would be your emotions it would be your vulnerability it would be your heart that's experiencing the the hurt um so yeah code i mean codependents uh, do experience pain that we are in probably too much in touch with with our uh, emotions and the more vulnerable aspects of ourselves so so yeah Okay, looking for um, <laughs> Wild Rose. Do you know what to do against flashbacks caused by a trauma? Yup, yup, I do. Oh, you want to know? Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a, a guy on YouTube, he's called Richard Gammon, or 
Rich Canning, something like that. He has like a whole channel. <laughs> if you go to my channel and, and you look on the uh, the playlists, one of the playlists is called CPTSD. <clears throat> um, and in that playlist, the first four videos that you see in that playlist, you should probably have a watch of them. I have a free course called <clears throat> How to Stop Emotional Excuse me. The Archons are punching me in the throat. How to Stop Emotional Flashbacks. That's a, a PDF and a video and an audio. And uh, it takes about two hours to absorb the information. And then about 30 days to do it. It's only five times a day that you need to do the exercise. It only takes about 45 seconds each time. And inside of 30 days, your emotional flashbacks will be significantly reduced. Uh, I saw a question before, and it slipped past me. So I'm looking for it now. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Um, UG Rose, thank you for moderating um, tonight. I always appreciate your help. So near you are. Is being single the best state to be in for a CPTSR afflicted individual? But aren't we all suffering from it? Um, I I don't know what's best, how it's best for people to live. I really don't know. Um, I can tell you what the, the potential consequences are of being in a relationship, but even, it's called the Spartan Life Coach, but it's a semi-ironic name because I don't really know how best people should live their actual lives. Like I'm not saying, I don't have a program where I'm like, everybody needs to just eat red meat or everybody just needs to be vegan. Everybody should worship this God. I, I, I don't, I have no idea. I can tell you the consequences. Uh, but that, that, that one, I, I would uh, back away from answering that. Lee Comstock says CPTSR question mark. Yeah, CPTSR. Uh, is complex post-traumatic stress response. So over the course of a lifetime, people build up an amount of micro traumas um, that manifest as um, flashbacks. And they're not visual and auditory flashbacks like somebody who's been through a traumatic or violent incident would experience. They're purely emotional. So you get no visual memory, but you will just experience, for example, intense anxiety or tense, intense fear or anger and it seems to come from nowhere, but it's actually a flashback from a previous traumatic incident. I have uh, on the channel, if you go to the playlist section, it says CPTSR, some explanations, including one that's just called What is CPTSD? Which is about five minutes long, dead easy to understand. If you see pictures of me in a shirt with a pen in front of a whiteboard, those are good videos on resolving uh, CPTSR as well. Oh no. Oleg Cherkaski Cher says micro traumas sounds like microaggressions. Coincidence? <laughs> That's an unfortunate coincidence. They both have the word micro in them. That is an unfortunate coincidence. If I could think of a better term, I'll, I'll use it. Or, the, or they'll just have to stop saying microaggressions. Uh, Teresa Stelmat says, How do you find the motivation for self care when it's so instinctual not to do? Thank you, Teresa, for bringing me back to the uh, other part of this uh, live, which is about learned helplessness. The other day, I released uh, another video, a short video, in the CPTSR Thriver series called uh, The Sad Baby Archetype, which is this idea that when people go into certain emotional states, they're actually showing up as a an archetype or personality, and one of them is the sad baby. The sad baby is the baby that can't help itself cries for attention to try and recruit the agency of adults and fails to, or they ignore him or her. And the baby's only other option is to become sad and to just lie there and go, well, what's the point? I think um, we all carry elements of this through to childhood because not every, every baby has all of its needs satisfied all the time. Every baby is a sad baby at some point in its, in its life. That's just... That's just reality. That's the way it is. So we carry that through. I think when we talk about people who are sulking or um, certain types of depression even, I think is the sad baby archetype flashback showing up and showing up strong. 
So learned helplessness directly correlates, in my humble opinion, to childhood experiences of not being helped. The way we love ourselves as adults directly reflects the way we were loved by the adults in our lives as children. So if we were loved in a bullying, aggressive way, that was anxiety inducing, that's how we'll treat ourselves. Uh, if we were not taken care of, we won't take care of ourselves. So learned helplessness is literally is like a psycho psychological way of saying uh, entrained sadness, like you're trained to be sad and to just give up on yourself. What do we do about that? Well, I think that this kind of thing moves into the into a very important area of recovery from psychological trauma, which is philosophy. You've got to find a psychological position from which you can even want to be self-disciplined. You have to care about what happens to you. You have to care about you for your own sake. As codependents, we have to learn to care about ourselves the way previously we would have only ever cared about somebody else, and usually only if they were quite abusive and nasty. So you have to do it for yourself. It's a, a, a strange feeling. Uh, and, and quite a period of transition to start only doing things that are, or to predominantly be doing things that are in your self-interest where it is necessary. Because many people who are traumatized and struggle for a long time with anxiety, with depression, addiction, dissociation, and anger management, were simply not encouraged to be as children. The permission to be was withdrawn from them. They were too noisy. They were too whatever, energetic, or or they were not wanted. You know, a lot of us were born to parents who was emotionally immature dicks, and they just didn't really want kids. They thought they did, and then we showed up, and they're like, "Nah, this sucks. I don't enjoy this. This isn't one long fucking festival of fun. I don't really like this anymore." So then we're 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 growing we're growing up with this sense of not being welcome of not being good enough, of being in some way ugly or deformed or having something wrong with us. So this is, it's deep. Because the problem is deep, the solution needs to be deep. <clears throat> when I say deep here, I mean like global, it affects the whole being and it goes right away into the core of who you are, the fundament, your unconscious, your sense of self is, uh, is very damaged. Excuse me, it's from over my throat tonight. This is pure vodka, comrades. Purest vodka. Every, every time I take a sip, I get wiser and wiser. <laughs> it's not vodka. It is not vodka. Um, so, because it's deep, you need a deep solution. And then you have to start getting into philosophy and saying, why do I exist? Why do I exist? Do I deserve love? What is the purpose of life? What is reality? What is morality? What is right? What is wrong? And you need to be able to judge for yourself what is right, what is wrong, how a person should live. Because if you're unmoored from a moral philosophy, you're anybody's sucker. You're anybody's victim. You're anybody's fool. You're anybody's mark. Nothing easier than manipulating people who have no moral philosophy. They can't even tell if what you're doing is wrong or not. You can do whatever you want to them. And they're like, this is, well, I guess this is happening. And they don't even know if it's wrong or not. You're only gonna start fighting back and protecting yourself. You say, no, that's wrong. I don't, that's not what I want. A boundary is always a no. And you're only ever gonna protect something that you value. It is not going to be possible for you to live a life with any degree of energy, happiness, satisfaction, optimism, and usefulness and contribution to the tribe, which is what you must offer as contribution to your tribe. Um, if you don't value yourself, you have to value yourself. You have to find your way there somehow. Uh, and at that level, I would say, okay, it's down to the individual how you do it. I like philosophy. I have my spiritual beliefs. I have religious beliefs. I have weird beliefs about the, the way the world works and why we're here and all the rest of it. But uh, the point is that I have them. I have them. And that has allowed me to recover. 
if you don't have a moral value system, you won't recover. You won't thrive. It's impossible. Danielle D says, why is it so hard to sync your emotional intelligence to the intellectual knowledge? <laughs> i.e. the inner child trauma, the understanding of it, to acting from that knowledge. Uh, it's hard because... Why is it really hard? The real, real, real reason why it's hard is probably because we are not, we're, st we're still in a process of evolution and we are not advanced enough yet to be able to go, oh, I know it, so I'll do it. For us, we have language. And we say words to each other. We go, oh, ah, ooh, oh. we move our tongues and our mouths in weird ways. And, we, rah, 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 rah. and then I say words and you decode them. You decode the symbols, the little aural hieroglyphics that you decode to try and understand my meaning. That then, that has to be learned. That gets put in one part of your brain and you can understand something in that part of your brain. You can understand it completely, but never do one part of it ever. Um, putting it into action seems to go into a completely different part of the brain. When I say brain, I mean the, the whole uh, central nervous system. Because your brain, obviously, it goes all right the way down to your fingertips. It goes to your skin. The nerves are your brain. They're everywhere. They're throughout your whole body. And yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't get internalized. So this is a problem for all human beings. How have we dealt with it? You could look at the mystery religions. You could look at schools of magic, uh, initiations, use of psychedelics, use of trauma, use of intense pain, isolation. All of this to take people from knowing to doing. Um, you look at some military uh, training practices, martial arts training practices. They're all about taking people from knowing to doing, but they all have the same root principles. Everything I just mentioned, martial arts, magic, systems of mysticism, systems of religion, systems of psychology, philosophy, sport training, athletes, all of it. Discipline. Discipline, to be a disciple is to follow a discipline. To be an initiate, you must follow a discipline. To be that's what religion is. The word uh the word religio, I think it's contended, but I'm pretty sure uh that it's something to do with certain patterns of behavior that are adhered to over time. That's what makes it a religion. If your if your religion doesn't require you to do anything, it's, strictly speaking, it's not a religion. That's what being a disciple is. The root of dis discipline and disciple are from the same place. Consistent action over time, setting of intent, acting with discipline, use of rituals and symbols, martial arts, military, schools of magic, religion, all use ritual and symbol because it appeals to the unconscious and is powerful and works. And they do a lot of it. They bang out the reps. They do a lot of repetition. All these things that I just mentioned retrain the brain. They retrain the nervous system to go from knowledge to action. Religare to connect. Why does that sound a bit like a cult? Says Maritza. That's what cults do. Like if you, if the strictly speaking, you look at like uh, the recruitment into uh, a military unit, and you look at recruitment into a cult, they're not hugely different. Religion, same. Uh, martial arts, the same. You know, and you speak foreign words. You know, uh, it might be ancient Hebrew. 
it might be Aramaic, it might be Arabic, it might be Latin, it might be Greek, but it's not your language you're speaking. I don't speak Japanese unless I'm in, you know, unless I'm doing karate or Aikido or ninjutsu. Do you know what I mean? You you go into that other the other space so that you can go from knowing to doing. But it is a very cult like. Nick Bravo, how do I stop feeling responsible for the feelings of beautiful women? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, why? Why? I have a question for you. Why do you keep breaking all their hearts? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why you feel responsible for the feelings of beautiful women. My friend, I have no idea. It sounds like a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful problem to have. There are too many beautiful women getting me involved in their feelings. <laughs> Laura D says, I am leaving military after many years. Yeah, well, uh, good luck to you. Good luck to you. Uh, that, that, that can be quite a period of, of readjustment. There'll be many things about being in the military that you'll miss, even if you've had a shit time there. Um, that's it's human nature. We are perverted creatures. Okay. Uh, we're going to start moving towards um, the end now. Um, so if we get a few more questions that are on topic, sentence long, ending in a question mark, I'd be extremely grateful. Um, that would be good. Pro-Life says, why are you breaking their hearts? Why you make it, Nick? Why you do it? Nick, don't break their hearts. I think that Nick just worded his question badly. That's all. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. I hope that you could take this in the spirit that's intended. It was a funny question, though. If you rewrite that and resend it to me, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Otherwise, we're just going to be saying, don't break their hearts anymore. <laughs> Uh, okay. Annie D said, did you watch the fight last night? What fight? 43 seconds for Conor McGregor to bounce into the ring, launch into the lad, smash his face open with shoulder strikes that Cerrone didn't even try and block. It was really strange. But it's the first time I've seen shoulder strikes used that effectively in, uh, in the UFC ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's something that I was taught when I was boxing when I was a kid. We class that as, well, it's dirty boxing. It's cheating. So I do actually do it on the on the pad sometimes, and I remember. Um, but yeah, he did uh, he did a good job. He looks very sharp. He looks ready. He's come back humble, focused. He's a little bit older, a little bit more mature, and I think we're going to see a good run of fights from from Conor now, which is which is great. Uh, would you do seventy five hard again? Yeah, I would. I would. Um, it, was, it was really really helpful for me. Really helpful. Sarah says, would you recommend ayahuasca as a treatment for flashback? Unfortunately, I can't um, because I don't know who you're going to do it with and I don't know where the ceremony is going to be done. I was not impressed by the people who organized my ceremony and I would never recommend any of my clients to go to, through that. It's not even, that was before, not even about the drug and the experience of it. It was so disorganized and weird and the people were like, really hostile, really cult-like, really arrogant yoga twerps. It was like something out of a JPC is sketch. If you don't know, JPC is uh, he's like a comedian on, on YouTube. Um, and it was just low-key, middle-class narcissism. Everybody's there to just prove how fucking enlightened they are. And that was horrible. The drug itself, that's a different thing. Happy to talk about it elsewhere or on another day with a, with with a different context, but I don't want to give people the false hope that like going and taking ayahuasca is going to do is going to magically heal anything um, because I, I I seriously doubt that that it would, and it could be a very traumatizing experience. So my answer to you has to be no, it has to be no. But at the same time, I did get something from it. That's the truth. That's the honest truth. But I'm very resilient in that type of ultra fucking weird, highly narcissistic environment. 
because I don't give a fuck. I don't. It was it was awful for me. It was awful. It was awful to the point where, in my head, I was like, "I'm going to do what I want to do, and if I have to knock somebody out, I will do it." That was the vibe in the room. It was that hostile. It was really bad. Really so. I walked away from it being like, oh my, I got obsessed with ego for like two months after that. I was like, Jesus Christ, what is wrong with the human ego? How can you, what kind of a species are we that will go to a ceremony that's all about letting, breaking down boundaries and letting go of the ego? And we find a way to do it ego maniacally. I'm like, God help me. What? <laughs> this is crazy. Totally crazy. Did Nick come back? Nick, where are you? I feel I feel a little bit bad now. <laughs> Nick's gone. He has too many beautiful women to, to speak to us anymore. He's a busy man. Uh, Oleg uh, asks, what are the consequences of having an uh, atheistic, a religious worldview as opposed to religious and spiritualism? I don't know, my mate. I think it would be different. The consequences would be different person by person. Why did you even do it? And what was the gain? Um, I'll leave that, I think, for another day. It's, it's an interesting subject. I, I'm happy to get into it, but I need to be in the right mindset because it's such a tightrope walk. Because if I tell you what, like everything that happened and the insights I got, people are going to be like, I want that. I want that. Let me, let me book on. And I really want to tell people, please don't. Or if you've got CPTSR, get some work done first and only go with people who've already been to the ceremony organizers that just protect yourselves really protect yourselves michelle asks emdr question mark question mark question mark somatic therapy question mark question mark question mark limbic system question mark question mark question mark yes yeah did you say yoga twerps yes i did I went to a yoga class today. Thank you very much. I'm glad you asked. And I really enjoyed it. I'm not saying everybody does yoga as a twerp, but you know the type, man. If you do yoga, there are some people who are so far up their own arse just because they do a bit of stretching. <laughs> Fuck out of here. Nonsense. It's foolishness. Pure foolishness. Danielle D says, I'm new to your channel and I have many questions. I bet you do. This is this is something that's developed over a so you're 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 at like the 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 newest part of a the tail end of a conversation that's been going on since 2012. Could you imagine that? You walk in on a conversation between groups of people from all different countries all over the world and they've been chatting for eight years. I'm like, what are you guys talk? What is all this jargon? What are these weird in-jokes and references to? <laughs> Must be a nightmare. One which you might touch on in the future is shifting from being a reaction to being cause. Yes, that would be interesting. I'd be interested to do that. Okie dokie. Um, I am going to stop now. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. There is a, a new course out. It's free. Um, it's the Fortress Mental Health Protection System. If you sign up, uh, if you want to get on it, you can sign up via the link below. It's in the top comment. I pinned it to the top. The emotional uh, stop emotional flashback course is there as well. It's free to download. Both courses are free. The Fortress Mental Health Protection System is still in development. The first video is out. The second video will be out tomorrow. It's going to be a 10 or 12 video course in which i'm going to try and sum up everything i'm going to try and make it concise and short which will be an achievement for me as you know um so if you fancy that jump on it and um we're, i'm basically going to tell you step by step what i do with people when i do coaching to resolve the the most mental health issues uh depression anxiety anger management addiction uh and dissociation um and it's a step-by-step -step system this is where we start this is where we go to if something goes wrong this is the, the step that we go back to so on and so forth so it's going to be fairly exhaustive um it's been a privilege and an honor speaking to you all and i'm very very glad that you uh that you showed up and supported me thank you guys 
Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I look forward to speaking to you all again soon. So thank you very much. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.